Hey, very good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Sean. This is Alex. And this is Finn. And you're listening to Coaster Kings Radio. Radio. <laughs> so close. Okay. Um, this week is the last week of the year, 2021. Uh-huh. We're presenting to you the Crystal Crown Awards. Yay. We brought it back from 2020. This year with 16 unique categories. Mm-hmm. Um, Are you sure? Which will be... Yes, yeah. we actually 16 counted them we counted <laughs> for recording this. To make sure. Because we are prepared. We are so prepared. <laughs> and this is a very professional podcast. <laughs> Because we are uh, the we, professional academy mm-hmm. that yeah. Yeah, judges. Yeah, the academy, academy. academy of Crystal Crown Awards coaster <laughs> and theme park aficionados. And we're, and we're also very humble. We are so <laughs> humble and kind, as Tim McGraw once said. <laughs> I've never listened to Tim McGraw, but I didn't know he said oh that. Oh my god, <laughs> He's a country artist, for yes, those yes. that don't know. He's also an actor, I think. That's great. Let's continue. <laughs> because that's the fact everyone wanted to hear in this episode. Yeah, that's exactly. Yes, that's we should do random fact of the week. Yeah. And this is the random fact of the week. <laughs> Tim McGraw is a country artist. Let's dive into the awards. Focus. <laughs> okay, so today we're going to start the ceremony with a drum roll from Sven, like last season. Okay. Boom! Wow. First category. Most promising product line. Mm-hmm. And our winner is. <laughs> Mac Rides Extreme Spinner. Yay. Congratulations, Mac. Hashtag Mac Product. Babe, I swear to God. So, the Mac Extreme Spinner uh, won this category <laughs> for the main reason that it is, in a way, revolutionizing an old concept of the spinning coaster. It's been two decades since the spinning coaster came out. And now the spinning coaster is able to launch, it's able to have inversions, it's able to be um, feature onboard audio. I mean, there's been onboard audio, but um, just the way that it encompasses all of these different technologies that we've kind of had already and combined them all in one, um, especially on Ride to Happiness and Pop Santa Pana, it really feels like a new coming of X2. Do Mm -hmm. you agree? Yeah. Um, And that's the reason I think this product has so much to offer. Just between Time Traveler and Silver Dollar City, which is the uh, big terrain coaster version of it, um, and then the Flatland um, customization that was able to be created for time, for a ride to happiness in Popsalon, mm-hmm. I really think that the future is you know limitless. The, the, the sky is um, the limit, and I'm excited to see what we what we can expect next. I already have a whole list of parks that I think need one mm-hmm. because it's like the next. The Magic next, Mountain, of course, is at the top. The top yeah. list. Yeah. It's like the next natural evolution. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they really offer an intensity um, that we haven't seen, I think, since since X2 mm-hmm. became a thing. Don't they also um, have like a small version, like uh, Skyrocket 2 Like type? a compact? Yeah, the original. Yeah, I think they have. That's the original concept. The two system. rollovers. And like, but they're kind of situated sideways, so like in the stations in the middle of it. Yeah. So yeah, the original... Was just the Mac Extreme Spinner was actually the name of a product line, mm-hmm. like, like like a product model. Yeah, we were excited type. to see that when Time Traveler was announced that the first one was a custom one. Which really surprised me because I would I would have personally thought that it would have started kind of like the Skyrocket threes did with yeah. the Skyrocket, mm-hmm. you know, with like a product, like a like a production. I think model, one of those off the shelf. And then ones going to really customs, inevitable. but it was straight into custom rides, which is really cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's definitely something that smaller parks could also build with that smaller version, and you'd still have a very unique ride because every ride yeah. experience is different. And um, yeah, they they really stepped up their game with uh, offering a kind of ride like Ride to Happiness. And I think it's just so much more interesting than, like, I think when Blue Fire came out, and even all the way up to rides like Copperhead Strike, people were like. You know, what well, Intamin could do this too. Intamin does this their way, like they did it first. But Intamin's not offering the extreme spinner type of product line. So I think that's something that Mac is doing now that has really um, given them a unique product that is super competitive mm-hmm. in this market. Well, one thing I find kind of interesting is that I, I don't necessarily associate historically Mac with super intense yeah. limit pushing attractions. Oh, nobody does, yeah. Um, and of course, now they're building you know, Hurricane and Sucho, which is very limit pushing. Oh my but god. Before mm-hmm. Hurricane and Sucho, we had Time Traveler and Rides of Happiness, and both those rides really pushed the limits of what modern coasters have been doing. Um, and it's just refreshing 
to see such a such a new take and such a you know a, a limit pushing take that actually seems to be succeeding. Um, time Traveler, nor Ride to Happiness, is riddled with problems like the original 4D coasters were. Yeah, or the original, they're very consistent um, product lines Yeah, so or like far. the original RMCs. Like, this is just a really consistent product line. I think that's why it's so promising. Parks are going to be like, okay, well, I want one, but everyone's having problems with them. I want something them. spectacular they can, and like, marketable. They can confidently purchase one of these and make it custom and have a really promising and, and marketable traction without the fear of it being one of those rides that like, you know, it's gonna act up every five seconds yeah, yeah. and it, it, it causing all these customer relation issues. So, um, yes, I think that's why it makes it such a promising, mm -hmm. promising new ride. Alrighty. Next up is our most consistent product line. Most consistent product line. So, a product line that has been around for a while and every installation is consistently, frequently a good ride. There's no like, mm bad installations even after like the 12th or 15th or however many installations there are of this ride. So the winner for most consistent product line is B&M Wing Coaster. The B&M Wing Coaster. So, <laughs> so we know for a lot of people, whether it's whether in Europe or the United States or even uh, in China, for example, um, wing coasters may not necessarily be uh, the number one coaster at the given park that it's located at. They're usually just very consistent, low fuss, high impact, high capacity, like workhorse rides. Reliable. Reliable, reliable. Mm -hmm. and they have a beautiful presence. But I think I find that now the, the, the ride line is, a, is about 10 years old now, and it's continuing to gain speed, and I think not only are new B&M wing coasters getting more and more beautiful and spectacular and show-stopping uh, and more and more parks are using them to anchor either a new park or a new area of the park like Avalon uh, at Toverland um, but the ones that have been around for 10 years mm -hmm. are, are still going strong and I think are aging really well rides like X-Flight uh, Raptor at Gardaland uh, Dollywood's uh, Wild Eagle these rides um, are still very strong, like showcase attractions for B and M, and and very uh, powerful and satisfying contributions to their respective parks lineups. Ten years later. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't have said any better myself. Um, I think there's one thing that no matter which wind coast you end up riding, I always kind of know it's going to be a solid experience. Yeah. And of course, there's still differences between the ones. Of course, Phoenix is is more on the intense side, as then you have Wild Eagle, which feels a little more family friendly. By the end of the day, every experience um, is solid. It's something I look forward to. It's very, it's very distinct, but mm -hmm. I know I can always get my fix no matter which wind coast I ride. Mm -hmm. Yeah, plus you said that they may not be the main attraction at some of the parks, but in Europe, I think that's, that is the case still. Cause like, I think a statement is mostly for America. For the U.S. Because yeah. Because even in Asia, I mean, every park I've been to in Asia, the where there's a wing coaster, that is the coaster. Yeah, that is true. Mm -hmm. I would say that for HB World, for uh, Wuchi Sunak Land, and of course for Chaimuang Ocean Kingdom, their wing coasters are the signature e-ticket roller coaster for those parks. And they do market themselves, too, when you mm -hmm. think about it. I mean, they're very graceful yeah. when this... You know, they're I feel so like when elegant. I see one, I'm like, oh, it's just an elegant, just like, pure like, elegant awesome ride. Just like opulent it's not necessarily right. presence. Like that. But even in the U.S., I think Gatekeeper is quite underrated. A lot of Cedar Point enthusiasts um, don't necessarily consider that one of their favorites. But for me, I think that was that was a, a six-year gap between coasters for Cedar Point. It was like a long-awaited, much-needed new coaster for mm -hmm. that park, and it came with the the much-needed revamp of the entrance, and it became this fabulous like hood ornament um, for the whole operation. And I think they couldn't have done a better job than they did. It was a pitch-perfect choice, and it. It's in my Cedar Point top five handily. Oh. I believe it's in yours as well. Definitely. Um, and and for like Holiday World, Thunderbird with the the launch function for it, it's very unique, even among a product line that's quite varied from installation to installation. I look forward to seeing another launched one um, in the future at some point. Some of these things are almost two hundred feet tall, like the one in Wuchi. I mean, there's just so much you can do with these rides. So, I mm -hmm. just look forward to more. I hope the U.S. gets another one soon. I hope Europe continues to build them. And of course, there's already like four or five more under construction. There's one in China that just started testing. That's like really, like a lot, the whole ride yeah, is like kind of elevated off the, future, the ground. Or something? Yeah. And it looks really, really special. It looks very gatekeeper, uh, Wuchi Sunak sort of 
vibes of giant cobalt blue colored ride. Um, of course, achieving the desired effect once again. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, looking forward to more of those as as the as time goes on. And um, to finish the awards linked to product lines, let's talk about the most innovative product line for this year, and that's the Vekoma Flying Coaster! Yay! <laughs> In other words, fly! Fly, yeah, specifically. Fly. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it's good to note that it is indeed the most uh, innovative product line which already has an installation, yeah. uh, because there might be some other coaster product lines out there that could also be for this category yeah but, um, like like access deserves kind exactly, of a shout out yeah. the, the new SNS access but, mm -hmm. but it isn't proven until it's proven and yeah. Yeah. fly has been proven and it, it I hope the rumors are true that the first one will be in Europe as well uh, just like yeah. the, the, the Vicoma flying coaster um, yeah, that'll be a future winner of this award <laughs> if, it, uh, if we ever actually see one get built yeah but um I mean, there's no denying that the way they improved the, the flying coaster is uh, quite something. It's, it's more comfortable to um, get seated in the trains itself. And then there's also the flexibility of, yeah, you have, watch out for spoilers here, but you have first yeah. a, a dark ride uh, part of the ride, which Where is... you're sitting upright. Exactly. And it's traveling, you know, horizontally mm -hmm. like a... Like an Omnimover, almost. Yeah, and I think that scene is is probably one of my favorite coaster scenes I've ever done on a coaster. Uh, it's my favorite part of the ride. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <It's the very laughs> and then also the way it switches you towards the launch, it's like so fluent. I mean, seamless. Yeah, yeah fluid, seamless. And um, and then yeah, the ride itself. I do feel that the restraints are a bit intense sometimes like I'm, I'm not going to say like trouble breathing but it's <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it's close especially in the back of the train so that's... I thought I was going to collapse mm -hmm. after my second ride it's very intense it's incorrect for me it's very intense now I posted about it being intense on Instagram and a bunch of German and French and Dutch and and kids from Instagram were like, it's not that intense. And I'm like, okay, maybe I'm just old. Yeah. But <laughs> maybe I'm just out well, of shape. Yeah, but I feel well, like I'm, I'm planking for two and a half minutes on the roller coaster. And by the time it's over, I'm so relieved. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> but, it, but then I'm like... It's not... It's not like intense in a way that it gives you a headache. But it's more like a workout. Like you, you mentioned yeah. it. It's, it's, it's <laughs> not... Holding yourself up almost. Yeah. <laughs> Because there are indeed other coasters that are like f that you have the intensity feeling, like an um, a giant inverted uh, boomerang. There, I would yeah. say, okay, that's an intense ride mm -hmm. um, that can scare off people. While I would consider fly still a family experience, but it's just the way you're in the restraints that is intense. If that makes yeah. sense. And, and I also think that the the award. Kind of like I mentioned before, the versatility of being able to um, create a dark ride scene or a show scene, or um, even if you really wanted to, if you want to park the train, you could park in front of a screen and have like an actual, you know, like mm -hmm. like a standstill theater kind of uh, moment. But then there's also the fact that um, this is the first flying coaster that can launch, mm -hmm. and that's a really big aspect for me when it comes to its innovation. Is that a flying coaster? You would think after all these years of flying coasters recreating the sensation of flying that a, a, a launched one finally came along and it feels so natural yeah mm -hmm. it really feels like it's almost like it feels like it's almost like a flying always coaster meant to be because they mm -hmm. tight turns launches show scenes no other flying coaster has ever done even remotely something as versatile plus it's well designed with its airtime moments um that's also a, a big shout out for vicoma it's so just wow, like having airtime on a flyer. The mm -hmm. application of this ride, and, and it, it would, if it, even if it was just a launch flying coaster, or even if it was just a flying coaster that like solved the riddle of like how to efficiently load and unload flying coasters, and mm -hmm. how to efficiently bring you from the loading position to the flying position, even if it was just one of those two things accomplished, it would still be incredibly innovative. But the fact that this ride does both at the same time 
and because it's Fantasialand and Wolfberg oh, is yeah. such a slam dunk, you really couldn't have asked for a better ride. It, mm-hmm. it, it feels too good to be true. Every time we like riding it and walking around there, I'm like, I can't believe this is real. It's funny. It made me believe for the first time that we could see one of like a flying coast at a Disney Universal Park. Yeah. This is begging for an mm-hmm. Iron Man application. Because it's meant to be Just high capacity. Begging. I mean, how trains can it run at once? At least three can it run four? Sorry, can you repeat? How many trains does it run? I know it runs three, but can it run four at the same time? Uh, I'm not sure about that. Might be, but the trains are pretty long. Yeah. Um, only 20 passengers each, though. They're not that big. Yeah. Just... Well, Disney could make one the size of Guardians or Tron, and, and yeah. well, it would have to be the size of Guardians, and then mm-hmm. they could put as many trains as they wanted. They could put five trains on it. But yeah, to be fair, if you think about Tron, for example, there's only 14 passengers in each Tron train, so if you time out the trains well enough, you can make anything happen, do yeah. you believe? Mm-hmm. It's the magic for me. Okay. Yeah. Let's go dark. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So Turn out the lights. Next up. The category for most immersive dark ride goes to Harry Potter and the Forbidden Journey. Yeah. Located at Universal, Universal Studios Island Avenger, Universal Studio Japan, Universal Studios Hollywood, and Universal Beijing Resort. And of VR. course in Europe where Harry Potter Oh, right. No. Yeah. Just JK. And the port of it to Oh JK. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> ended a while ago. There's also um, one in, in Abu Dhabi. <laughs> so the main reason that Forbidden Journey gets this award is because it is the only dark ride in the world of mass scale where there's lots of physical sets, animatronics, screens, all that sort of stuff, where you are always the front row. There is no sitting behind someone else, there is nobody's feet in front of you, there's nobody's head in front of you. You are the sole person in the scene at the moment of it happening, and the fluidity at which your Florida's ride vehicles move through the show building, it is incredibly immersive. You are inches away from the dragon, the dragon Breeze fire fog right into your face. You're <laughs> inches away from the spiders. You're inches away from the whomping willow. You're inches away from the um, dementors. In oh, fact, yeah. you're so close to the dementors that the arms of the dementors in um, Orlando had to be removed because people could like, just rip them off. Yeah, the fingertips of the dementors the were like. You, you were so like, close and hit in every single moment in the ride to the right scenery. You're always facing in the perfect direction because you can't look to the sides of you, you can only really look kind of forward. So, um, despite there being an array of really impressive, high-budget, incredible dark rides out there, there is still only one dark ride that puts you into action in this intensity, with this sort of immersion, and that's the Ben Journey. And I think it's almost, the front seat I feel like there's not a ride that even gets close. It mm-hmm. injects you Thanks right to the into the center of, of the ride everything. Mm-hmm. No bad seats, no bad rides. Oh, yeah. That's a quick one. I really have much to add. Yeah. That's kind of really that's how I feel about it. I guess it already thing. starts with the queue as well, because... You're immediately brought into the world of Harry Potter and and uh, the way you go through the castle, you recognize things from the movie and yeah, to that's say already the, the immersion that starts there, you know? The queue yeah, is the that best That was the 2020 winner for best queue. Yeah. Um, this ride's going to win an award every like, year. Every year gonna it's going to have some different awards. <laughs> <laughs> you know, last year it was best queue shop. No, yeah, um. <laughs> best queue <gift> shop. <laughs> best locker system. Actually, let me make a note. <laughs> <laughs> Most nauseating dark ride. Um, but yeah, no, I really think that there's not a single ride that comes close. And um, Universal's Epic Universe is rumored to get a newer version of this mm-hmm. ride system for yeah. the Monster Universal Monsters Dark Ride, located on the um, left side in the park. And it is rumored to have ride vehicles where you can actually look off to the side. They're a little more open air, mm-hmm. which means that they're expected to not have any screens. They have a complete physical it's world only. Effects, yeah. That would be really, very really interesting. Really cool. yeah. Amazing, if true. We'll see. We'll but yeah, I see. think up to now, and I think there's a reason that. Despite some people sometimes getting nauseous on the ride, um, it's almost like uh, a token to how incredibly, um, God, how do you try to extravagant the ride yeah. really is. There's a reason Universal keeps cloning it. The fact obviously. that it, it just really um, fills your field of vision with substance. I think the more you ride it, like I, I found it nauseating the first time I rode it. The more you ride it, once you can anticipate some of the movements, it gets a lot better. The ride almost has like a learning curve. I mean, you can't just like kick back on it on your first mm-hmm. ride. You really, uh, there were times where I had to close my eyes because it was just like too much. But th- the more you ride it, the better it gets because you can uh, kind of experience mm-hmm. all of the scenes without being distracted by uh, what your body is doing. It all kind of works <laughs> together exactly. instead of like working against the rider. <laughs> and now, that beautifully leads us to our next category, yes. which is also based on dark rides. Yeah. 
So our the best IP, best intellectual property based dark ride is or actually just intellectually property based ride, period, not just dark ride. Best IP based dark ride is Pirates of the Caribbean, I Battle for the Sunken Treasure. <laughs> yes, the best IP based ride. At Shanghai Pirates Disneyland. At Shanghai Disneyland. And so you might be thinking, well, wouldn't Harry Potter be the best IP based ride? Because like you literally just spent however long we spent just like going in circles talking about how amazing it is. I would say that immersive is subjective. I consider it fairly fact-based. Obviously, this is a lot of our opinions. Mm -hmm. But I would say that from as factual as you can be, I beseech you to find me a ride that would be more immersive than Harry Potter. It just simply is. That ride system just does At the end of the day, it's like you and three other people that can't even see each other in the face of every single aspect of the ride versus larger rides like Rides of Resistance or in this case, the winner Battle for Sunken Treasure where like you do share the ride vehicle with with a large amount of other people that could be sitting in front of you, that could be sitting next to you, you can physically look at it, it could be in your way and it also creates some distance between you and whatever physical or virtual sets you're interacting with because the ride vehicles are larger. And I think that's the difference between like what is the best IP based ride and what is the technically the most immersive. Yeah. Because you can only mm-hmm. be so immersive. Immersive if your for me is very matter of fact. The way that this ride system works is, is achieves something that is physically not possible on other rides. Best IP based ride, this Crystal Crown, is more opinion based. Mm-hmm. This is, I think something that will rep- reflect who we are um, as enthusiasts. We love Harry Potter. We love Star Wars. Um, but for me, I think Battle for Sunken Treasure is still my favorite dark ride because even though it's it's a big boat and you're sharing this journey with 28 other people, 29 other people, um, it is a little bit more uh, comfortable. It's not as punishing on the body. I think... Um, The only thing that would hold some people back from Forbidden Journey being like their be-all, end-all dark red experience is because it is taxing uh, on your body, whereas Battle for Sunken Treasure is a lot more of a relaxing kind of experience, which is something I I tend to crave when it comes to dark rides. The scene design, the set design, the the application of so many different varieties of of dark ride technology all coming together in this one ride, of course, is, is a huge part also of what makes this such a spectacular um, ride, and it's also fascinating to consider the way that um, this huge multi-billion-dollar-grossing film franchise was uh, expounded off of a ride, off of a single ride, Anaheim's Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, it became this huge, you know, industry-defining film franchise, and then we come full circle with um, a dark ride that is based not on the pre-existing. Disney rides, but on the film franchise that was inspired by those rides. Um, it feels like its own sequence of events inside of the, the canon of the, the Captain Jack Sparrow, Pirates of the Caribbean films, and feels like a, like a very satisfying contribution um, to that universe. So for those reasons and more, uh, we had to give it the award for, for best IP-based ride despite Harry Potter also being part of the same conversation. Well, another reason uh, that I want to add to the best IP-based ride is that um, obviously we look at a ride solely solely themed after major IP. So like they're telling a story that's either continuing a story that we know from the movies or they're telling a story that is from the movies um, or or whatever media they come from. But in this case, um, given it is the world's largest dark ride, it it has the world's largest show buildings, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean really does bring you into a different world. They're able to create um, a really unique blending of water with screens while the vehicle moves forwards, backwards. Um, had lots of physical sets and very. The screens don't act as in like you know screens. They very much act more as in like backgrounds. And I think overall the experience on the ride is quite unique, and it stands out to me a whole lot more as being a water-based motion simulator physical dark ride than a Trekkers Dark Ride would, because we've seen the Trekkers Dark Ride before. We've mm-hmm. seen it in many applications, but this is the only application in which we've ever seen the blending of water with screens and physical sets and show buildings that are so large, they're hard to describe. They're massive. Like, they're creating scenes where you really feel like you're deep in the it's water. It's like soaring inside a building. and pirates and 
the spoiler alert, there's a little roller coaster portion in there too. Yeah, it's a blending of <laughs> lots of like concepts and ideas and technologies that's only ever been once done like this at a very, very high budget to be the staple of a brand new high budget theme park. And I don't know if we'll ever see it again. Um, and I think that's uh, another reason why this uh, wins the best IP based ride for us. Totally. And then we go into the coasters again with yep. the, coasters. the best coaster color scheme for 2021 is MP <laughs> Express. Slash Lukey Luke. Yeah, not really Lukey Luke. Park Germany. Yet, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, isn't it? We're in a, we're in a transitional phase. We're, it's transitioning. Yeah. I love that for them. <laughs> oh, my gosh. But, yeah, so they have... Uh, a much needed repaint I think of the mm -hmm. SLC uh, coaster at uh, Movie Park Germany where um, the supports received a brown color but not just one brown color three different types and three different shades of brown yeah <laughs> <laughs> but it looks Got really you. good and the grey <laughs> is also there you know the grey yeah. is on the, the track 50 shades of it yeah <laughs> Not sure, but um, but then yeah, and then um, the trains are pretty much the same as before, right? So, uh, but then when you see them passing through, it's it gives a special effect on on your eyes. So the main difference is is that the trains used to be blue and teal. There were two trains, and now the trains are themed to the Dalton Brothers yes. from the popular Lucky Luke. Luke comic books where every other car is a different color between black and yellow. Yeah. So which is, you know, black to and yellow, imitate black and yellow. the stripes like a, Oh my god. On their <laughs> a Wiz Khalifa reference. On their outfits from the prison or jail is the correct Western term. Yes. Um, so it's definitely all being themed very heavily to Lucky Luke. Uh, or Lucky Luke, whatever you call it in English. Because at first year as a Dutch kid I was called Lucky Luke. Yeah. But it's, it's lucky. <laughs> but it's oh, yeah, lucky that's Luke, right. I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but yeah, overall the color scheme. I just um, think the trains are so nice. cool. And the, the, the trains are very roller coaster tycoon. The roller coaster, mm -hmm. yes, it's a total yeah. roller coaster tycoon fever dream. The supports, the whole track bed and supports are, it's like a very sophisticated canvas. It's just a really lovely looking ride that really fits the theme, but also stands out on in its own right. And then you have these like caution tape alternating black and yellow seats that are like so spectacular to look mm -hmm. at. I just like, I, I wish more parks would be this audacious with their color schemes. I think we're getting there because this, this is like 2021 is the year of the repaint. It's funny, I don't find it that <laughs> audacious. I really think that they kept the supports in the track and a color scheme that doesn't seem too flashy. It's very, not not so naturalistic, but it, it works color wise like, oh, yeah, really well. Like, it's it's, it's kind of sophisticated fit. yet, um, yet old timey. As where the trains that really pop, and I, I, I personally prefer trains that pop yeah. over track that pop with, yeah. with mediocre trains. Yeah, the trains. So I'm really impressed with it. Like really it. steal the show, and it's just captivating to look at. So could you imagine the SLC won an award? Yeah, <laughs> love that for them. <laughs> Only at coasterkings.com. Yeah, yeah, that's right. The coasterkings.com. Um, speaking of which, this whole dissertation. And more detail with lots of pictures, because I'm sure there's stuff that we're talking about that you have no clue listening to yeah. what it looks like. Uh, visit the Coast of Kings .com, um today when you listen to this mm -hmm. uh, coinciding article with pictures and more details um, for the Chris Crown Awards of 2021. Next right. category. So, next category. Now, this is an interesting one because this is a park we really wanted to highlight, and we were like, this park is spectacular, and there's nothing like it. And we couldn't figure out exactly the right way. Well, we couldn't figure it out like, why this park always time. comes to mind, despite it not necessarily being very high in the enthusiast list. Yeah. Um, and then we started kind of comparing other parks and saying, like, you know what, I think the main difference here is architecture. Mm -hmm. It's just like the world building. Yeah. So the award for a park with the best architecture goes to HB World, Hawaii Brothers World, and Suzhou in Jiangsu in China, which has turned an old classic um, theme park method into, uh, into into something else. So we all know Force Perspective. We've seen Force Perspective, Disney, Universal. Everyone's the queen of Force Perspective. They can make a castle seem 200 feet tall, while in reality it's like less than 100 feet tall. Little things like that. We've always kind of been used to like the worlds that we enter in theme parks looking really expansive, but you know, from a map, they're really not. Now, 
And the difference here is that HP World actually has built everything to life size. And this is the first theme park we have ever been to where they have recreated entire movie sets, entire, um, entire worlds from their popular movies and in, full, in full scale. So you will enter um, in, the, in the most highlighted area of this park. There are several really impressive areas, including um, an area themed as The Assembly, a popular Chinese war movie um, that's quite large. And then there is um, you know, some, some movie-themed street. I think it's called You Are the Star. But the biggest area is for sure the um, Tangchan Empire, which is from one of the movies that the Hoi brothers, um, a famous you know, brother duo um, in Chinese movie making, has created. And um, you are literally walking into a what do you call a castle temple, mm -hmm. the size of a of, of a forbidden city almost. Massive, massive. You have to walk. You can walk around there for for quite some time. And there is entire dark rides hidden. There is a roller coaster. There is a bunch of attractions, and they're all hidden within this giant temple. There is a 200 foot tall Buddha statue. Sticking over you, you can see it from miles away. It's incredibly impressive. Yeah, we can see it from the um, highway. And we were like, oh my god, there's the park. We're going you can to explore the entire temple. You can walk all around and walk in it. Um, it's it is just massive. The massive. scope of it is It's really hard to describe this because this is the only... I mean, we've all been to theme parks and we've been to hundreds combined. I think uh, Sam put together a map to coastkins.com slash map. And we have collectively been to like 850 parks worldwide as a team. This is the only park I have ever been to where they, the world building was done to scale. Um, and despite the park being quite large, there's only like three or four major areas, and that's because they're so massive. Mm -hmm. And that's really cool. And to top it all off, all the architecture is so detailed. It's very it's, it's, authentic. It's the bricks, it's the light fixtures, it's the, the letters, the carving, it's, it's all of the incredible detail that is all located, even the landscaping inside this park. While the rides themselves are are almost like an afterthought. I feel like the budget for this park, and that's the first thing you said when we were there, like the rides really, I mean, there's a bunch of dark rides, but they're all right. okay. You know, the coast the wind are, coaster the coast was good. Are, the wind yeah. coaster is awesome, the other coasters were whatever, but just being there is why we wanted to come back. Um, all the budget clearly went into the architecture, and it's something I really want to highlight. It's just so, it, it, it doesn't really feel like a themed park. Like, it doesn't feel like an amusement park. It just feels real. You just show up, and you're walking around, all of the Chinese architecture, this huge courtyard with all of these authentic buildings, and it's like, oh wow, like, this doesn't feel like an amusement park, it kind of just feels like a city, like that you're in somewhere really special, and then, and then you're like, oh, there's a ride here or there, but like everything, even like the pirate ship, which like, we have a picture of it on our article for coasterkings.com, and it's just like, the the, 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 uh, it's just the, 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 the wait, what? TheCoasterKings.com. What did I say? CoasterKings.com. I said TheCoasterKings.com. No, you said ForCoasterKings.com. I said TheCoasterKings.com. You said ForCoasterKings.com. No, I said TheCoasterKings.com. Yes, 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 yes. Shut up. That is so dumb <laughs> with us. Uh, <laughs> anyways, at TheCoasterKings.com, you can look at the pictures that we're referencing of HB World. It has its own article, but we also put some of the highlights from that article uh, for the art uh, for the um, Crystal Crowns article so that you can see exactly what we mean by... Uh, Building things to full life size. I think our favorite picture is the one where the wind coaster kind of sticks out. Like, oh yeah, that's right. There's rides here. Yeah, yeah. It's just kind of looming over what looks like a. Even the queue for the wind coaster was like weirdly, like detailed. Like the building entering it. Yeah. I had to sit there for a while. Yeah, it, it wasn't was, open it, yet. Yeah. This park just is such a, a lot to look at. Cool. Yep. <laughs> Next on our list mm -hmm. is the coaster with the best light package, which goes to. Can you guess when? Where's it go? Tron Light Cycle Power Tron. Run. <laughs> That's Woo! right. So, at uh, this, Shanghai Disneyland and soon. At Shanghai Disneyland at and Kingdom. soon, Magic Kingdom, Walt well, Disney World in Lake Buena Vista, Florida. <laughs> and States. Disney soon is probably, what is it now, 2024? Yeah. 2023? And soon in infinity. Disneyland Paris. Oh and, no, I'm dreaming. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> Maybe Anaheim. Maybe one or day. We'll that would be such a good fit for Discovery Land. Yeah. The reason we wanted to do this particular award and highlight this particular coaster is because uh, light schemes on coasters have become a very popular trend. Velocicoaster in particular feels like a very calculated response. Of course, Tron won't be open for a while and Velocicoaster is obviously already open, except that Tron is a clone of a ride that's already five years old, whereas Velocicoaster is brand, brand new. So they were taking a very close look, I think, at Tron in Shanghai. And for everything that Tron does, they wanted to do something similarly spectacular with the lighting schemes and stuff 
for Velocicoaster, it's just kind of there. Like, they have a, a story tie-in where, like, the, the blue lights are related to... Um, the infrared... Yeah, infrared security, security basically. The so, I, they, they imply that the lights are what's keeping you from, like, getting eaten by dinosaurs during the ride because they've been trained to avoid them. Something like that. But for Tron, it's like the lights are part of... That's like that's literally what it is. It's themed to. to it is themed literally yeah, to light. These motorcycles are physically made out of light per canon, so it's not just a, a peripheral that was designed to look good in photos. It really is the whole purpose of the attraction. The canopy, which I don't think gets enough credit, of course, is is a whole synchronized light show that that takes place with each train dispatch. That follows you around as you make your. Train test, the train dispatches can be as close together as like twenty. Yeah, to 25 like thirty seconds, seconds apart. Really, yeah. Sometimes you'll ha you'll you'll come to the launch bay and there's still a train in front of your launch. Yeah, yeah. Like if they have a good update or mm -hmm. like six six seven trains. Yeah, they run like seven trains on there's this thing. There's like it's not continuous that long. trains going through, so it's really cool. I love how the the lights on the trains themselves serve a lot of functions. Of course, canonically, you're on the blue team, so under most circumstances, your vehicle is a light blue color. When it's in the station, it's a dark blue, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it's dark blue. Or, or is it light blue, and then when you when your restraint locks, it turns dark, and then once the train is locked, it turns light blue again? Something like that. It has that. some sequence where, like, the lights you are actually... You know the vehicle is locked based on whether or not yeah, the, the lights the also function yeah. as, uh, like, they, do, they have their own little programming for, for getting the train ready for dispatch, and then once everybody's dispatched, it, they kind of, like, flash in, into the light blue sequence, and then your train takes off. And then more, more importantly, I think, is, is one of the scenes in the show building where you come up against a, a huge wall of mirrors, but the mirrors are meant to look like a, just a continuation of the scene, and you come up against your own train, but the lights on the left side of the train that reflect the mirror turn orange to, to represent, to, the, to represent the orange team that you're fighting against. Mm, okay. And it took, me a, it took me a couple of rides to like understand what I was seeing, but I was like, oh my god, it's our reflection, Like that's us. They're using just the left side of the train because if you're riding and you look down and it's still blue, it's just the left side of the left vehicles that turn orange for the mirror to give you this. That's this, interesting. It's so clever. It's one of those things that makes me think like, oh, Walt would have loved this. Like, this is such a Disney thing to do. But it's just, and, and, then, it, and then I could appreciate it even more. I'm like, wow, so these, you could program these. They're not only programmed in various shades of blue for various thematic and functionality purposes, but they are also orange. For the mirror scene, well, um, yes, in the and then every time it passes through either a power up arrow or it goes through one of the light, light gates, gates, they pulsate. The, they pulsate. It's, so, it's, like, so it interacts as well with like over a dozen thematic pieces along the ride track, where like the lights interact with the thematic piece. So overall, Flusco's looks really cute, and the pulsing of the lights when they work, which is like half the time. Yeah. Is you know it's it's cute. It's a natural choice um, for them to like, do that. It looks for very clean, coaster. but only one ride really uses lights as like the main focus Part of, of the, the attraction. Yeah. As well as having that whole canopy, which is like you know we're talking light packages. Light packages go off ride and external as well, like mm -hmm. floodlights, you know LED lights on the track. It all counts as light package. Um, but Tron's giant canopy having the hexagons interacting with the trains as they roll through it adds even more to the fact that the trains alone are like, you know, such a center focus. So overall, lights everywhere you go, um, but very clean, very purposeful, um, more than just a like, this ride looks cute at night situation, like mm -hmm. the whole ride is meant to be light. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So for nice. our next award, we have um, Best Coaster Pre-Show. Which goes to... Shredis <laughs> Kernan! Shredis Kernan! Hansa yes. Park! At Hansa Park, yeah. So, um, originally the award was going to go to Star Trek Operation Enterprise, but then uh, I went to Movie Park Germany this year and the pre show wasn't running. So yeah, it was a bit weird to COVID. give an award to a show that wasn't running. Uh, but maybe definitely next a year. Mention. Maybe next year, yeah. Definitely. A little yeah. shout out anyway. Yeah. A little shout out anyway. But then, um, yeah, we went with Kernan because, well, to start off, the queue is also quite the experience because you have uh, several uh, places where they explain the story via videos. So you're going into the museum of the Kernan Tower and then when it's almost time to board, you uh, go into a kind of studio of the builder uh, like the base mm -hmm. 
and that's where uh, they find secret compartments where you have to leave all your belongings and basically this is a bookcase which opens up to have your bags uh, put into uh, and that's when the main part of the pre-show let's say start uh, so again uh, be warned for spoilers here because Kernan is oh, yeah. full of spoilers. surprises but so yeah. this is something you don't if you haven't written it yet uh, it's better if you don't know but well Sean <laughs> and Alex too bad for you yeah. guys but oh, well. um, take one for the team yeah so um, for the sake of art <laughs> so you <laughs> are you can only access the um, the room with uh, max of 16 people the room of spells and um that's where uh, you can, like a regular coaster station, you line up in one... Uh, there's four rows for the coaster, so you line up in one of the four rows with your uh, friends and family. And then that's when almost you have the feeling that the room starts spinning because of the music, because of the lights that turn around in the circle uh, tower area. And then, uh, row by row... You the spell uh, decides where you can board the train. So if you go into the first row, you might up and end up in the last one or the third one, uh, and it's the room that decides where you go. And each time it's different. Um, so I guess the, on one hand, for enthusiasts, this might be annoying because you want to have that front seat or you want to have that back seat. That sounds very annoying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <it> sounds <laughs> like the first three times, we each time we got back row. So it was like, okay. It turned out for me personally, it was my favorite row. But, um, oh, yeah. So uh, that was like, okay, well, how do we do this then? So we changed strategy and it, it was pretty low on crowds that day so we could ride it uh, quite a few times so we decided okay now we're going to take each time the second lane before boarding to make sure that all of a sudden i guess statistically we would have a bigger shot to have than the front row and uh -huh. after the second time we already had the front row so not oh, sure if that was mathematically the smartest thing to do, but it worked. <laughs> <laughs> but so yeah, that whole experience and it's it's it doesn't need any language to understand, so that also helps for me and just the whole experience of the ride and and um, yeah, it, it's quite something. So I really uh, think that it's a good fit for this category. Awesome. I can't wait to write it. Um, I love yeah, that part. And if this, if this seems like an episode of spoiler for you, don't worry. Um, there's so much more to the ride. Definitely. That uh, we didn't spoil, so don't <laughs> think that we just, like, you know, you know, killed your dreams here. Yeah. Um, no. Still go ride. Sorry, yeah. that's getting in. <laughs> Hot Spark. Yes. We should probably put, like, a spoiler disclaimer, like, on this in whole episode. Notes. Like, in, in the show notes and, like, <laughs> as we're promoting it. It's, like, as a friendly reminder, we're going to talk about why some of these rides won their rewards. And some of those reasons uh, might be I feel be like it would be pretty spoiler-free. Right? I mean, I, this isn't the first time that we've talked about Pirates of the Caribbean having roller coaster track. But um, it might be the first time that somebody has heard that. And, uh, it, you know, so, I don't know. Well, there was another thing, too, that we, the way it is, we say something else about again. something that was, like, a spoiler, and we're like, well, all right, well. Next up. Too bad. Park with the best setting. Park with the best setting. Crystal Crown Award goes to Ocean Park, Hong Kong, in Hong Kong, China. Wait, I thought we agreed on Dippy Doe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Dutch wetlands are just incredible. Um, <laughs> yeah, Wallaby Holland. <laughs> wetlands for me. Um, is, no, but in all Dippy seriousness... Doesn't like, not even allow adults in? Isn't it, like, just for kids? I don't remember the details I think you that. have to bring along... Uh, it might be that you yeah, have to Yeah, there's a park out there that got that really in. unique, like, zero coaster, but, no, no, like... I, can get it. I know people mm -hmm. who have tried to get the credit, and then they weren't allowed in, because they didn't have How did Dippy do just steal the show? <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about Ocean Park here. The most phenomenal... The Crystal Crown Award scenic. for, like, dumbest requirements to enter the your park. The park with the best setting. <laughs> and now we're over here. Talking about Deepy Doo. It's Fen's, it's Fen's fault. <laughs> Let's go to Ocean Park. Ocean, Ocean Park. Park. Okay, located between um, Shenglong and the Deepwater Bay on the South Chinese Sea is a island that sticks out, <laughs> like most islands, like most islands in Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> um, a giant mountain located um, towards the south of Hong Kong. 
and this park is sprawling, it is massive. The only way to get from the entrance area on one side of the mountain to like most of the park which is located on the ocean side of the mountain, you have to either go through a underground tunnel in a funicular which takes quite a minute and goes really fast mm -hmm. or you have to go all the way around the mountain in a sky ride which gives the most amazing views. You're a couple hundred feet over the ocean, you see giant shipping containers just like dwarfed in the distance. Um, you see other islands kind of off to the side, but you can just look out to the open ocean all the way down to the Southeast Asian, um, you know, countries and islands. And it is absolutely incredible. Every single ride has a view. There's lots of different levels and plateaus and platforms that um, the park is located on. Because the park really is on a steep hill. So like most of, most of your walking is going to be steep hills or staircases between little plateaus along the mountain. Um, the park a couple years ago actually opened up all their backstage um, roads, so those roads are all part of the park walkways now, so you can really walk all the way around uh, where you used to have to kind of go through the center of the park, which is located where the funicular meets, um, the new rainforest area. But it's really, really impressive that no matter where you look, no matter what ride you're riding, you're facing off into the distance, whether you're on Hair Racer, which is suspended over the ocean, or, you know, the late, unfortunate dead dragon that closed this year. Um, which we have which a mini soda on. We have a mini soda coming up on that as well. Um, you would literally be facing the, ride, uh, the ocean um, while you're navigating the ride, like coming out of the loop into the dirt turn far over the ocean. Mm -hmm. It's all things like that. Um, this is the only park that ever comes close to kind of um, winning this sort of award. I'm hoping, I'm, ex I'm looking forward to the future for Ocean Park, the departure of all of their classic rides, like the, the Mine Train and Dragon, which were famous for their incredible oceanfront views. It's it's a hard pill to swallow, but um, the park is worthy of this award regardless, and we just look well, forward to Well, I will say, even with those rides being sorely missed, when we go again, yeah, I'm just going to be enamored with just walking around and enjoying yeah. the view. And they just mm -hmm. opened their new water park, Waterworld, yeah, which has looks um, lots beautiful. of multi-levels too, yeah. half in or half out there, with also some incredibly scenic views of the ocean as you go down, like them, the Mad Racer, things mm -hmm. like that. So. Um, if you have the topography like that, it's very expensive to maintain, very expensive to build on, which is why Ocean Park is continually struggling despite its decent attendance. Um, it is, you know, it, it still makes for a very, very unique experience. So, um, I yes. would, I would also give a shout out to Tibidabo at uh, Oh yeah, sure, Barcelona because mm -hmm. basically it's it's. If you enjoy going to the beach, if you enjoy going to cities, and if you enjoy the mountains, you get all three the right TV there, view-wise. Mm -hmm. Reminds so. me of, um, of um, OCT East, very similar to oh, located yes. on a beach, town, resort, half goes mm -hmm. town, of course. Yeah. Um, but the same thing, uh, mountains, amazing views. Um, but I think Hong Kong Ocean Park being surrounded like 270 degrees yeah. by mm -hmm. open ocean like you're like it's like on this mountain sticking out the ocean um it just it's it's unmatched it's crazy i can't wait to go to tv dabo that'll probably be a future winner of this category <laughs> sure. when we do, finally do our like giant spain trip i look forward i look so forward to doing spain um plus it yes, has a vacoma next... with a yeah and still it's got... one of the best drops that I've ever yeah, had. the Vacoma. It's one of our favorite product lines, the Vacoma MK700. So it's like a big giant outdoor Fogel Rock or Temple mm -hmm. of the Lift Hill at Plantage Land. Temple so, of the Mountain. Temple of the Lift Hill. <laughs> crazy right. bats. Yeah, I finally did crazy a, bats. the VR version, by the way, and it was. Oh, did you like it? I mean, it was. There was something <laughs> going on in the ride, you know. I'm not a big VR person, as as yeah, you know, I've mentioned. Like before, I mean, who is? It was. They, they really was thought pretty... the industry really thought that everybody loved VR for like a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And the crazy bats was the are year pretty of the cute, VR coaster. So. Yeah. So is it an actual known franchise, or is it just kind of? It's from uh, Mac. Uh, so. Um, Interesting. Yeah, it's part of the like they Mac also has the Happy Family characters. Uh, yeah, uh, I, yeah I think the, in the, the second Happy Family movie, VR. The bats are also in the second movie, so um, I kind of thought those were related. Wow, so Mac has a whole multi. There was thing um, oh yeah, the Happy Family VR on Titan at Selva Magica and Guadalajara. I didn't want to do the VR because I really don't like VR, but I like the coaster. Um, you know what, guys? I think I have to go to the toilet. <laughs> Where should I go? <laughs> Well, if you're looking for the park with the best bathrooms, look no further 
Then Animal Kingdom, particularly the Pandora World of Avatar section, because these bathrooms are spectacular. Um, few theme parks can say that the bathrooms are part of the overall uh, experience. There's definitely parks that can say that, particularly. Like the tribe with the Woodsy World of Harry Potter. World. Stuff. Like they're thematically appropriate. Moaning Myrtles. But are awkward. they like clean contributions? And sophisticated really? in the restroom that I yeah. want to like take my time I don't time remember in? that. No. Yeah, she's like talking. It's really, oh, yeah. it's really creepy. She'll like, she's I trying to have a full too. conversation while you're like on the pot, like <laughs> trying to do your business. <laughs> and then there's like the bathrooms at Galaxy's Edge, which are, you know, thematic, but they're kind of just, they're just kind of there. there. Basic, yeah. The Pandora mm-hmm. bathrooms are amazing, especially the ones, if you enter Pandora from Discovery Island, you know, walking toward um, Navi, Navi River. River Adventure, those bathrooms on your left are just so detailed. It's unbelievable. The general theme of uh, existing, like, U.S. government infrastructure slowly being reclaimed by the nature, uh, the flora and fauna of Pandora. The bathrooms are no exception. Uh, and I just I just can't believe... It's, I guess it, because it's one of the first things you see when you walk into that area, it's important for them to stick the landing uh, on everything you look at, and that includes the bathrooms. You go into the bathrooms, and they're very clean and lovely on the inside. Um, well, yeah, they're very sophisticated, too. It's, it's very modern aesthetic inside, um, and they're very clean. They're spacious. Yeah, I got weird to have a whole conversation about a bathroom on this theme park. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but Pandora has three bathrooms, and they're all different because there's the set over by the restaurant that's in an old aircraft hangar, which looks really nice, and then there's the secret bathrooms that are halfway through the queue, on a uh, flight of passage, which oh, yeah. not only are they are they very convenient and cleverly positioned, but they have one of the best little thematic touches of any thing I've ever seen. There's a little sign, and it says "humans only." The bathrooms are not to be used by Navi people because the ceilings are too low and they will hit their heads. And there's a little diagram of a Navi person That's hitting funny. their head on the roof. Yeah. So the sign, the, just so just in case you were wondering, the bathrooms are only used for humans because they are too small for Navi people to use. And so for, the, I mean, for that reason alone, I had to mention something related to mm-hmm. these bathrooms. But then we thought, well, a whole bathroom category is very on brand, I think, for our awards. So here you know we what, are. You know what makes you need to go to the bathroom? Yeah. <laughs> Drinking. Se- the world. Drinking. That's such a great segue. <laughs> so the <laughs> next... Category is the best cocktail, which uh, goes to the avocado margarita from La Cava de Tequila and Epcot. This Mexico category Pavilion. was basically made for Epcot. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> drinking at theme parks is obviously an Orlando thing, um, yeah. and like, it's starting to become a thing everywhere now. Um, we've had some decent cocktails in Europe, too. There's a running joke nothing that, Nothing like... matches the avocado margarita. It even has some cold following. Yeah. And like, I buy it because, like, it's my favorite drink. Oh, my God. It's so good. So what they do is they take half. I mean, the actual official ingredient list for this is not available anywhere. Everyone's trying to get it. Everyone's yeah. asking the bartenders. Nobody ever gives away the it's secret. secret. You know? Ooh, the secret's of La Cava. Anyway. <laughs> That's what like it a is, dark ride. after quite some research, <laughs> is that um, it is composed of tequila banco, agave nectar, melon liqueur, and half an avocado. Blend it together in a blender. A little rim oh, and a blender. with some chili lime. Yeah, in a blender. <laughs> you can't blend it together in a microwave. I don't know. <laughs> Blenders weren't a thing way back in the old days of La Cava. So I don't I'm know. just checking. Okay. So you use a blender to blend it. Yes, you sure do. With some ice. And then you drink it. Yeah. And it's absolutely spectacular. It tastes more like a smoothie. It mm-hmm. has a really nice like tequila and agave flavor to it. How do you describe it? It's just so stupid. The avocado good. is it's so like, pleasant. It's like, I feel healthy drinking soothing, it, but at the same time having a great time. Comforting. It's so comforting. I could drink a million of these. <laughs> and, it, and it definitely <laughs> plays to, it. to so the good. running gag of like, well, the best way to have fun at Epcot is to drink, because otherwise you get bored. Not so. the Lacava. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you start running around Epcot with, with uh, a, a, an avocado margarita in each hand. And like, yes, they are a little expensive. Every drink at Lacava tequila is a little bit expensive, because it's like specifically meant for like really nice cocktails. Well, it's craft and alcohol. Like, it's and like a craft martini. And but. Margarita. It's so worth it. Yeah. Because you also get a half an avocado, which is yeah. healthy. So, like, when in doubt, <laughs> avocado margarita. Oh, <laughs> Definitely yeah. healthy. And Epcot. <laughs> Avocados are expensive anyway, so if you're going to pay too much for a, a beverage, you know, get one with half an avocado in it. So, yeah, I thought the category was super fun. So, yeah. uh, Sven, when you go to Epcot next year, or whenever you may end up going this yeah. pandemic, 
Yeah, um, that's the thing. It's not so easy to get there, but there is a park that is very easy to get to. And the easiest. Oh, yeah. What is the easiest park to get to? <laughs> the park with the best public infrastructure. Crystal Crown Award goes to... Disneyland Paris. Disneyland Paris. <laughs> Yay. And Marlo so, Ballet. <laughs> Paris, France. For a fact, it is time-wise from door to Disneyland Paris faster for me to take public transport than to take than to take the car. That's well, amazing. Well, That's so Euro. okay, it's not entirely true, but <laughs> first I need to drive to the train station and then it's um, then it's for dramatic effect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um Disneyland Paris, you can reach it uh obviously by car. But the thing is, the um, parking prices are really expensive for European standards. Uh, I mean, 35, 30 euros is... is that's, that's, that's a ticket to American most shit. smaller yeah. theme parks in Europe, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so it's definitely worth checking out uh, using the public transport. Um, there is the train station at uh, marne la vallee Chessy. I like the way they pronounce it as well in the, I know, yeah. the stations, um, which is accessible from multiple major cities in Europe, uh, not just in France, but also from the Netherlands, from Belgium, from the UK, well, not longer in Europe, but from the UK as well. So it's really um, easy with the TGV, with the Wigo, with the, the Thales, uh, Eurostar. <laughs> Oh yeah! <laughs> um, um, wonders, if you know, you know. It is the sound you know, you know. of the little train announcements. Yeah, and yeah, the then, train station chime lives in my mind rent free. Yeah, and and also if you're visiting to Paris itself, you can take the RER um, to uh, Disneyland Paris as well. It's basically the same station, but uh, that's the metro kind, underground kind of uh, entrance. Uh, compared to the actual railway station. Uh, and then for you guys, yeah, you have experiences from the airport. Yeah, super it's easy. I mean, we can literally jump on a plane from the US, land in Paris in the morning, um, go through customs, and then a few steps away in the middle of Terminal 2, which almost everything flies into Terminal 2 and in, in, um, Charles de Gaulle, um, you literally just take a train down to the train station and you jump on the TGV. And within 10 minutes, you're yeah. at the front gate. The nine-minute train ride. Mm -hmm. It is so stupid convenient. Um, there's not a park in the world. Like, a lot of parks have either a bus station. In the U.S., you're, you're, you're fancy with a bus station. Um, you have, of course, your parking lots. You know, some have train stations in, within, like, a block or two away. Or they have, like, their own metro station. That sort of thing. But this time, Paris is the only theme park resort that I've ever been to. We've been to quite a few. Where there is trains, buses, parking lots and a metro system and it all connects within a couple of feet from each other like it's mm -hmm. all kind of stacked but it's so convenient that like between Disney Village Walt Disney Studios Park and Park Disneyland all those you know within those three corners everything is in there like all mm -hmm. it all just kind of meets in the yeah. middle and it's super convenient like it's crazy how well organized that is it's just fast. compared to anywhere else like we could step off an aircraft in Terminal 2 and be at Disneyland Paris in like an hour it's crazy and it's funny, but actually, uh, when we were having lunch earlier at some really crazy good taco place in Orlando, if you ever need to go, Hot oh, yeah. Tacos. Hot Taco, um, Lake Nona. Lake Nona. Uh, <laughs> we, were, we were talking about, like, you know, the new Brightline train that comes from Orlando Interna International Airport. It's going to go to Miami. It'll open late next year. And then, you know, they're going to build the extension to Disney Springs. And we're just thinking, like, all these tourists that come from interna like, internationally, they don't have a choice except for taking a bus mm -hmm. um, that is pre-organized with their trip or to rent a car to get around Orlando. Or, or like Uber or taxi. It's so weird to me because anywhere else we ever go in the world, we use public transit. It must be very frustrating for tourists to come to Orlando. Yeah, like, <laughs> I mean, only, when like, I started planning that, I was so frustrated by why can't I just walk or take a train yeah. or something like that? And <laughs> uh, obviously, I don't understand the scope maybe of Orlando, but um, still, if you're used to Disneyland Paris uh, and and some of the other parks in Europe, then it's like. Why? <laughs> the convenience and the positioning of Disneyland Paris and the way it's set up will mm -hmm. spoil you. Like, 
It'll make every other theme park resort even, feel unnecessarily even, yeah, complicated. Even the Disney parks in Asia are not that convenient. Okay, there's a train line, like a singular train line that, that runs to Hong Kong's resort. But you still have to kind of walk a little bit from the train station. From Japan, too, it's kind of situated off to the side. Um, for Shanghai, it's like you have to take a separate metro line. Like, there's no like train line. But again, like Paris has all of them. All Honestly, of, for Shanghai, all of the it's possible... easier to take a taxi, which is like... Yeah. It's kind of funny it's that it's the China. easiest way yeah. to do it, and it's not very expensive. Hong Kong, you still have to make a connection. You still have to connect in a train station. It's right next to the airport. Like, it's physically right close to the airport, but getting from the Hong Kong airport to Hong Kong Disneyland is still more time-consuming than going from Charles de Gaulle to Disneyland Paris. It's really, really cool. And Hong Tokyo Kong's also. Organized. It's like the, the Tokyo train system is, is, is amazing, but it's also very, very complicated. So it's not this, like, easy... You know, it, like, it, it's... The, the Paris setup is so easy. It requires, like, no thought. Especially with the Tokyo event. I mean, I made the mistake of buying RER tickets that one time. <laughs> I was <laughs> about to say, uh, unless you because forget to book. It was, like, right as the borders reopened that same week. Yeah. I went to, to um, France, and they were, like, really capping public transit on how many seats. So you couldn't buy the tickets in the train station unless you went to a counter or you booked them online. And so I booked RER tickets instead. So we went through the metro, through the city. But even that was really that was a lovely really had to make one little jump. I, I, was like, I really enjoyed that. Yeah, no regrets. But yeah, it it is a, an advice to uh, book early because the earlier you book your tickets, the cheaper they are. Yeah, yeah. We 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 usually are the people that book them on the spot, and we used to pay like what's mm-hmm. it like thirty six bucks um, mm-hmm. for, for ten, ten minutes, minutes, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> for ten people, yeah. Um, but it's super convenient though. I mean, if you take a car just from the airport or like the hotel we stay yeah. at the airport, it always takes so long, and the train is super super convenient. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Next up, we're going to shift gears a little bit. We're yeah. going to move to the best nighttime spectacular, which goes to Ocean Resistance at Chanlong Ocean Kingdom and Zhuhai in South China, not too far from Hong Kong, from mm-hmm. our earlier topic. Um, how, where do I start? I don't know. Um, so, long story short, this is such an over-the-top, crazy nighttime spectacular that it makes Disney stuff look weak. Like week week. And all Disney stuff. All Disney stuff. Whether it's Magic Kingdom or Epcot or like, you know, any of the high budget productions, it makes it look weak. So the best way for me to put it is I've only created one night test spectacular ever. <laughs> it's just this one. I was so overwhelmed. Even though I had prepared myself for it uh-huh. because I wanted to see it so badly. I asked like ten people who worked there what time the show was, so I couldn't possibly miss it. Right. Um, which I guess you could possibly miss it no matter how hard you try it. Yeah. Because it takes over the entire park. So um, pretty much what it is is a giant central lagoon, um, which is called the Hanking Lagoon. It's inside of Chamlin Ocean Kingdom, of course. And within that, you know, lagoon, there are water fountains, um, which are all on during the day. They do just little fountain shows. Uh, but then for the ocean resistance, that has particularly the entire park kind of comes to light. So the best way I can do it is just to list you all the different things that happen. And then you, on the other side of this microphone, you can imagine all that happening all at once. And then you understand why I may have cried. So, let me start. So, you need to imagine simultaneously occurring events, okay? So, there's perimeter fireworks. So, at seven points around the park, they're shooting off fireworks pretty much consistently for like 25 minutes. Just like nice big Chinese shells, you know? Mm-hmm. Big freaking China yeah. pyro. It's China. China it. pyro, okay? Yeah. I'm saying. Um, then. When you look at the middle of the, of the water, there's jet skis going around, like eight of them. They have fireworks attached to them, so they're like lighting, launching fireworks off the jet ski. Pretty wild, okay? And then there's flyboards at four points in the lagoon. There's people on flyboards, which are like water jet, jet, yeah, jet packs. Yeah, water jet pack. Where like you're standing on a flyboard with a lot of water coming out of it, and they do like jumps and loops, whatever, and they have backpacks on, and there's fireworks shooting out of their backpacks, okay? This wouldn't be legal if it wasn't in China, okay? Like, super crazy stuff. And then there's a lot of projection mapping on a 200 foot giant whale shark that comes out of the lagoon yeah, thematically. The shark, but it's right next to the lagoon. Mid and reach. behind it is also an ocean of fireworks, okay? Um, and so there's lots going on. And the story is really not clear, but like you're so immersed in it, yeah. you're like, whoa, what the hell? Yeah, we have no idea what is happening. You in know, the story, there's like Chinese matter. talking, it's very intense. It it's like very intense Chinese talking, and there's lots going on. <laughs> Um, but there's just a lot of pyro and fireworks and dancing and whatever. And then there's also the giant, like, Bellagio sized. Um, if not larger, these because water fountains are over fountains. 100 feet, and there's just water fountains going on continuously. Now you think about it, okay, it's a lot, but there's also 
a lot of fire on the yeah, lagoon the because lagoon they like also pumped on in fire. oil and they just like light up the whole lagoon. Yeah. So there's fire and jet skis and flyboards and fireworks and water fountains and lights and lasers, lots of music, some crazy story that we can't understand because it's Chinese. And then there is two sets of drones drone hovering show. over it doing a whole drone show. And that is literally so intense that I'm like tearing up talking the about 3D it. It's like the wild jellyfish event drone seen. and the three and the dragon flying dragon drone that, like, show. Breathes, and then like the whole lagoon turns into fire. <laughs> and like I don't know where out of the ocean resistance this dragon came. If he lives in the ocean, whatever the story is. Yeah. Wild, absolutely wild. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Alex, did you cry? <laughs> I did cry. It, it was, was hysterical. So stupid over the top. I, I, that was the second time I cried. Oh my cried god! The next day, part. we literally were about to cancel all of our plans for the rest of the trip. We're like, "Okay, we're going back." We're because we went to the, the aquarium, the and the aquarium with the whale sharks was so spectacular. I teared oh up a god. little bit. That it whole like park is just, just the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen in my life. And then we saw the the, the fireworks show and the music, <laughs> the score. The music for the uh, for Ocean Resistance, the score, the orchestral music, is so good that I was like, and really then afterwards, the, 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 the harmonies definitely got inspired by this. Yeah. Then the fireworks stop, and they keep uh, all the luck. The yeah. jet skis the show and has the flyboard people come over to the side. You can meet them and stuff, yeah. and they wave at you, whatever. And you're just like crying, and you're like, "What the hell?" Yeah. I'm like having an emotional um, meltdown. And then, but then there's like another hour of the park being open. And they, the whole Central Lagoon is like a light show with, with lasers like and dance like party. water and stuff. And so wow. like the show is almost like has like a second hour long show after that. Um, the park is a total vibe. Yeah. And that show, absolutely out of the world spectacular. So there's like a pop, a dance pop oh remix of the orchestral score for the show that then plays out as you like dance your way <laughs> around the park for the next hour. We got a couple pictures on the website. I mean, it's really hard to photograph that. And we're also, we really, really pretty photo. We're really yeah. trying to photograph It was hard too to much. like capture we what was happening to, because like, we were like, take it all we in. were like trembling. We're just like taking circles. Like first we're like, oh, why did all the coasts close so early? But then you realize like yeah. everything lights on fire. The like, entire park is the stage for the show. It's incredible. If you think harmonious or, or illuminations taking up, you know, the entire world showcase is, is amazing. And for the, like that whole half of the park being the stage. And I if mean, you kind of wonder, like, well, where does that money come from? It's also China's most visited theme park. Yeah. So with their 11 million annual They're the eighth attended park in the world in 2019. Like, they have visitors. They have money. They have yeah. the largest um, hotel in mainland China when it comes to the amount of rooms. So they're a massive resort. They're opening the second gate in 2022, and they're opening the third gate in 2025. So they're like... Coming after Universal and Disney. Yeah, Chime well, already is the already in the top five grossing theme park chains. And, and they, they have only two have two resorts. resorts. Yeah. They only have two parks, uh -huh. a zoo, and a water park, and a circus. So if, when you're in the Canton region, you have to go to some of the Chime Long stuff. They are out of this world. They're, cha they're taking um, over the world. I'm ready for Chime Long to make landfall in Europe and America. But you have to stay. When you go to Chime Long Kingdom, which if you're an avid reader or listener to our show or our, our website, you know that we are big Chime Long Ocean Kingdom people. Yeah. Like, how do you know that? Even Sven's over our yeah, shit. Yeah, people. <laughs> but, we have friends and <laughs> listeners who are too. But, uh, I usually know what's about coming. Chime Long Ocean Kingdom but, in this episode. Like, but yeah, shoot me a bucket list and then you have to stay. You cannot leave before the show. Yeah. If you leave for the show, then like, you need to follow. There's also a really nice nighttime parade. There's a daytime parade. The nighttime parade happens shortly before the nighttime show. And the nighttime parade is amazing in its and own right. It actually won several actual awards that are yeah, a fake awards. Like real awards. Yeah, this park also wins regular, like normal vetted awards and also has several Guinness World Records. So, so yes. Yeah. Ocean Resistance. Ocean Resistance. Okay. All right, I think that was my last presentation. Yeah. Gonna <laughs> All right, yeah, drink some water. <laughs> <laughs> you did good, soldier. Okay. Next. Best coaster layout is uh, kind of a broad category, but we were excited. I think this is a very defensible one. I think so it, it's defensible? easy to defend. Yeah, I think it's it's a it's an easy. I think it's an easy win for this ride because when you think best coaster layout, that's your, your mind kind of takes off. It's like, oh wow, there could be a lot of things that like a lot of coasters that would be worthy of this. But there but are no coasters like this one. There are no coasters quite like. Is that how you gonna say it? <laughs> Velocicoaster! Velocicoaster! <laughs> Jurassic World Velocicoaster. Like, the Jurassic one. Hang on. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Velocicoaster for us feels, I think it's best described as somebody's No Limits 2 pipe dream roller coaster that somehow, um, despite all of the odds, was actually sold, purchased, and built. Um, this ride is long, it has every trick in Intamin's book. It's really two rides in one. The first half is um, like a miniature town at Fantasia Land. With inversions. 
With, with the versions missing. and uh, with Velociraptors, you are inside the raptor paddock, you know, bouncing around through the rock work. There's waterfalls and things. And then you, you dive down under, intersecting the first launch with your second mid-ride launch. And it takes off and, and becomes like a storm runner at Hershey Park on steroids, where you take off into the spectacular top hat, the airtime across the board throughout the train is out of control. Um, in fact, you get airtime like twice in the back seat because you get it as you're coming into the top hat and then it has the magnets at the top that slow you down and then it whips you over the top. Um, the second half of the ride is just balls out insane. It's got the, it's got the, the, the big stall hanging sequence. It's got the double helix. It's got the off axis airtime hill. There's all of these dives and sweeps and swoops and it's flying over the midway and, and touching the water and then when you're, when you've already feel like you're ready, like you've had enough, and you're like ready to tap out. Then the Mosasaurus roll happens with it, with its incredible upside down airtime sequence at like sixty miles per hour. Over the lagoon. And then it, and then it takes off. Then two final bunny hops, and then leaps into the final brake run. And it's it's one of those rides. I'm like every time I ride it, I'm like, oh, I need a cigarette after that one, and I don't even <laughs> smoke. This thing is just so... I, I just couldn't imagine a ride like this existing. Hold on to your butts. It's far... <laughs> it's a reference to the original Jurassic Park. It's just, it, the ride it feels so far-fetched. I mean, I remember when, they, when it was leaked, when the design was leaked, and I'm like, no way. Some 12-year-old kid made this on his computer in his mom's basement. Like, there's no way that a park is actually going to build something this massive. It, it's just so pie in the sky, over the top. But you know that's the that when when Universal sees the opportunity, when Disney leaves the door open for Universal to walk through and bridge that gap between the two resorts, this is what happens when when a ride like Tron and a ride like Guardians of the Galaxy is on the horizon for Disney World. Universal said we're gonna pony up and we're gonna build the most spectacular launch roller coaster in the world with the most incredible layout and. We're going to give people multiple ride experiences in one while also telling a beautiful story, offering an amazing aesthetic. Um, and I just, every time I ride it, I'm just in a state of disbelief. I can't believe it's really real and, and that it's in Orlando, of all places. Um, so, we, of course, we, we were thrilled. We thought, what has the best coaster layout? And I'm like, well, I beseech you to find me one that has a better overall layout than Velocicoaster. Yeah, and one thing I want to add to that real quick is, um, and you kind of already touched on this, is that... The Floss Coaster does very many different things, some like two rides in one, and somehow, in a ride that is as long as Floss Coaster is, they manage to not have a single moment or single element that is the same on the ride. Yeah, nothing really, about really it feels unique, repetitive. Especially when you look at stuff like Tile, which this ride is compared to Tile all the time, but I feel like Tile does the same thing over and over and over. It does it very well, but it does it repeatedly. As our philosophy goes, there's not a single second or not a single element, not a single dive, not a single turn that feels even remotely like the first. Everything in this ride so, feels like really it's impressive. greater than the sum of its parts. You take everything and add it together, and somehow it's even greater substance than what, you, what you're looking at on paper. It's even more than meets the eye, despite it having such amazing curve appeal and being so awe-inspiring just to, just to look at it. So. Exactly. And that's that. Speaking of intimates, though, <laughs> yes, our last category was a very sad story. Mm -hmm. But so still, because of the intimates. they deserve yes. it. The Park yes. so, of the Year Award. So and this is an editor's, editor's choice, choice. Kind of situation, mm -hmm. so this is not arguable. I don't want to hear you on social media saying, like, what? This is not the Park of the Year. Yeah, I'm like, yes, no. it is the Park of the Year. It's yes. been why? Well, before we say why, let's say who. And it's <laughs> Wally B. Belgium. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I forgot that part. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, if you had said why, people would have figured it out. They would have been like, okay, this park is the only park that we could be talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, um, let's go back to 2001, when Cobra <laughs> and Loop Garou were built at Wallaby, Belgium. And since then, they had not opened a thrill coaster, like an actual thrilling coaster um, so for 20 years uh, they announced the plans I think if I remember well somewhere around 2016-2017 uh, just yeah. after Pulsar opened um, their five year plan and the top highlight that everyone in Belgium was looking forward to was uh, 
Conda eventually in uh, 2021. And it even made Plopsa shift gears and built a world-class coaster on their side as well. Uh, but so, yeah, then obviously COVID happened, but they pushed through and they promised that in 2021 the ride would open. Eventually, with all the measures, the park could open in May, uh, beginning of May, May 8th. That was when the Belgium theme park season started. And obviously, Conda was a big success. Um, people were excited going back. and um, But then mid-July, though, so an important season. Um, and obviously, the summer season is the place uh, when people go to theme parks. But mid-July, uh, there were big floodings uh, happening in Belgium because of uh, major rainstorms. Like, really, a lot of rain that fell in a very short amount of time. And there's a river that runs through the park, which flooded. And it, it, the park had to close for about three months because of that. So in the year that you open one of your biggest rides ever, if not the biggest ever... Two months later. Yeah, <laughs> that's when water struck, not lightning. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, in October, they reopened... And I went there, uh, actually, on a very fun trip with the brake section team. Um, and it was like nothing happened. I mean, it was incredible, the, the work that all of the personnel put into cleaning up the park. Like, there was not... <sighs> you really had to, to uh, have an eye for water damage anywhere. Uh, Obviously, there were some of the rides that weren't functioning yet, but even those, uh, Pulsar ended up running um, for the Halloween season, which is a very important season. So I'm very glad that they were able to reopen and get some um, money back in during uh, October. Uh, but um, and and they they are a, the park is on such a roll to becoming more modern again and they're really brushing up the areas that need some love um so uh yeah and and they push through uh, another good thing about the the um, the way they handled it they were not like crying out everywhere like yeah this is the worst thing that ever happened to us no they were just okay it happened let's get things done to get it open again and that's the spirit they uh went with and that was uh that's why we can only congratulate them this year and that they definitely deserve this award yes Park of the year. Well, Park of the year. And Sean and I still haven't been, yeah. but it's already... <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, it was just just before when you guys planned your trip. I know, like a week trip. before, too. Hey, but that's how we got on fly, though, because fly wasn't yeah. on the schedule. Yeah, and we went to Fantasia Land and wrote fly. Yeah. So we're like, so, okay, um, we'll, we'll catch Wallaby Belgium next time. We can't wait to go. I love that park. It's, mm -hmm. I love that park, even though I haven't been. <laughs> it's the OG Wallaby, list. so... Yeah, I know. Fast. There's so many Vacomas, I really can't wait. <laughs> like, I cannot wait. The winter for Coma Land. Yeah. There. <laughs> and that rounds off our Crystal Crown Awards. Let us conclude our award ceremony. Let us know on thecoastcast.com or on our social media channels or our Discord. <laughs> what do you think of these awards? What winners should have been? Different winners? Go argue with us. Except for Wallaby Belgium. Well, Wallaby Belgium, yeah, that way well, you cannot. Don't argue with some <laughs> that. We won't have it. Um, and we look forward to hearing from you. Um, make sure to check out the article as well to get full pictures of everything we talked about because mm -hmm. there may be some things that you're not really familiar with. Um, find that um, as well. And I wish everyone a happy new year. <laughs> happy May 2022. Happy be a slightly less messy than 2021. Yeah, I know. May Omicron. I had a pretty good 2021, honestly. Yeah. Love that for you. This is my least stressful year in like years. Hey, we bought a whole house. Or not. But that was not as stressful as my years prior. So wow. I really enjoyed my 2021. 2021 was fine. We got to go to Europe, which was cute, but we also still had twice. to cancel. Mm -hmm. Sorry, twice. We still had to cancel our like major Asia trip again. Yeah. Now. We'll go soon. In soon enough. Yeah, for me, it was the year that I didn't go to the US again, but uh, <laughs> I could have. <laughs> yeah, well, Next year. We'll see. It's going to be awesome. We look forward to hosting yeah, you here. That's time. right. We're excited. And stay at Coaster but, Kings uh, headquarters. Yeah, I, th I do think 2022 will bring some fun stuff again. Not major 
Uh, I think there's not a lot of major coasters coming uh, in Europe, at least. But um, Asia and the US is quite some good stuff for yeah. the SeaWorld parks that are taking. Yeah, all the delayed 2020 stuff, stuff for SeaWorld. Yeah. yeah. So that's kind of be exciting. And of course, we got so many repaints all around, all over the place. So yeah. lots of exciting Love stuff repaint. nonetheless. I'm very excited. Just for another year, theme parking as usual. And, and without further ado, we'll be there. Oh, we'll be there. <laughs> Anything else you want to add? No, I think that about covers Any, it. Any like New Year's wishes? Don't get too drunk. Yeah. Don't get too drunk. Yeah, I don't even know if you'll listen, be listening to this before. No more year. COVID variants, are, please. Enjoy your New Year's <laughs> Eve. And we'll see you next year. See you next year. Bye. Bye. Bye.